Last but not least for today is our panel on purposeful leadership, moderated by our very own editorial director, Paul Lewis. Purposeful leadership has really taken hold in uh, only the last few years, and I'd say is exasperated by a combined um, stream storm of, of conscious consumers, employee preferences, and a realization that a company's purpose is about far more than just making profits for the shareholders. So let's kick off our panel on purposeful leadership, uh, where we'll hear about leadership challenges uh, that the panelists are currently facing in their organization. Um, over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Gustav. Um... And good afternoon and welcome to this last session of the day uh, on purposeful leadership. It's a big topic, uh, much of which has been touched on already, uh, but I'm delighted to be joined uh, by my panelists who will give a range of uh, perspectives. Uh, Ian Walker, who's Senior Director of Talent Development for Salesforce. Mitch Beckman, a CHRO of Weber, a US unit of Ferrovial. Nandani Linton, a VP of Organizational Growth at Siemens Energy, and Harriet Whaley Cohen, a leadership and DEI facilitator with many clients across many sectors. So purposeful leadership seems to mean different things to different companies and has certainly changed over time. Uh, not too long ago, pur purpose in business seemed to be focused on the bottom line, so long as there were no breaches of the rules. Uh, people then began to talk about how producing goods and services that consumers really want is inherently a social good because it solves problems in the markets, whether they're big or small. But as companies began to understand that all stakeholders matter um, and then realized that companies may have actually quite a role to play in society more generally. Um, expectations of them uh, from within and outside um, have dramatically changed, as Gustav um, has alluded to. Um, we all now seem to be affected by events in the world, and leaders are asking, you know, what is the narrative that can explain a company's broader role in society in a way that is both convincing and powerful? Um, now, throughout this session, please do ask questions um, and we'll try to answer them either during the discussion or towards the end of the discussion. Um, it's part and parcel of this learning process. So do let me start uh, with Ian. Uh, now, your founder at Salesforce, Mark Benioff, has been very vocal about the company purpose and how the question really is, how has his message filtered through the organization um, and how effective has it been, Ian? Well, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think to answer that question, we need to un understand that bigger picture, which is what I've loved the, the sequence of the sessions which we've been tapping into. I think it's important to put it into that wider societal context. You know, we're dealing with unprecedented complexity and ambiguity, um, obviously with the climate, uh, with what's happened in Ukraine, with the recent pandemic. Um, with changes in, in politics, you know, we're moving from a world 20, 30 years ago where we were looking at democracy as being something which is going to become pervasive. Now that seems to be under threat as well. So, so many of the certainties which we've taken for granted historically now seem to be uh, not, not there anymore. So that ground is something which has shifted and which feels much, uh, much less certain. So I think in response to that, um, our company has, has done a few things and continues to do a few things, and we'll talk a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about that. The first is that um, we've added sustainability explicitly as one of our values. Um, it's always been there. It's always been something we've, we've focused on, but we have we've had four values up until now. Um, trust being the, the number one value. We always talk about trust, um, customer success, equality, um, and innovation. Um, which obviously for a tech company is really important to, to remain ahead of the game. But we've added sustainability and a head of sustainability, we, he was at a leadership development event I was on recently and he talked about this need for every leader in the company to start incorporating sustainability into everything that we do. And that's a complete mind shift, I think. Um, 
And when I think about sustainability, I don't just think about the way probably he interprets it, which is, you know, climate and, and sustainability from the planetary point of view, but also sustainability as a business. And I think that's a real key shift that we're seeing now within Salesforce is really thinking about, okay, we're, we're now 70,000 people. We're no longer a, a, a young startup. Um, you know, Benioff is still in place, as you mentioned him. Um, we still have a lot of the same leadership in place and we still have an amazing agility in place. But we also need to think about how can we become more sustainable long term as a business. So I think sustainability takes on this, this bigger view. And the third thing, which also came out of, I think, the last discussion around ageism is inclusivity, inclusivity, diversity and equality as being another driver. I talked about it's one of our key values, but I think that's something which, which we're seeing as being a key driver within our, our company as well. So at the corporate level, you know, we've always had this concept of stakeholder versus shareholder capitalism as being one of our underpinning principles, as, as you mentioned, Paul. Um, I think it was Larry Fink who described it. Well, society is demanding that companies serve a social purpose. So they need to think much more about what is the why, as Simon Sinek talked about, what is the why behind the, 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 the company that I work for? And I think particularly the younger generation, but I would also include myself, it's always been really important to me to work for a company that has very strong values and values that I can associate with and buy into. But I think that's that's becoming increasingly important. And Salesforce has always been a very, very values-driven uh, company. And we use that explicitly. We talk every company meeting about trust, particularly trust with our customers, trust with our employees, and trust in our technology as well. So it's, it's trust in a very holistic, uh, holistic sense. So if I think about how that translates to leadership at the individual level, if we look into the past, and I know some of um, your previous speakers have alluded to this, I think purpose in leadership in the past was really rooted in the leader themselves. It was this idea that, you know, the Steve Jobs of this world, the Bill Gates of this world, the Jack Welch of this world, very strong personalities with very strong purpose, but they kind of pulled people almost physically with them rather than enabled them and supported them um, uh, in, 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 bringing them, in bringing them with them. And I think that's a, that's a shift which we're seeing in leadership, which I'll talk to. Um, we had this very strong command and control model in the past, um, which was in some ways successful, um, but it had a, I think it had a significant human cost. And I think you know, if, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us that command and control is is an illusion. Maybe it's always been a bit of an illusion, uh, but you can't look over someone's shoulder when they're working, you know, remotely from you as a leader. So I think that's something which has shifted uh, shifted dramatically. And I think that you know, even in the early two thousands, Jim Collins in his book Good to Great called out this idea that actually leaders that can lead from the back or from the side are actually more effective than those that only have this position at the front where they're riding the white stallion and have to be the center of attention and, 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 and be seen to be leading uh, explicitly. So if I think if we take this to the present, I came across this acronym recently, which has been around for a while, but it's kind of a parallel to, to VUCA, which is, I think, uh, Rory Simpson talked about the VUCA world. It's the Bani world we live in now, which is, there's a brittleness about what's going on, which is leading to an anxiety um, and this kind of idea that we have this long non-linear complexity, which people are finding difficult then uh, to, to, to comprehend. So brittleness, anxiety, non-linearity, and incomprehensibility, I think is now a theme uh, which leaders are having to contend with. Um, and so I think leaders that need to tap into different voices in order to uh, in order to address that. And if I think about something that uh, the late General Colin Powell said, he was on Salesforce's board. Um, he talked about the importance of listening to every voice in the room before he spoke. As the most senior person in the room, he recognized that if he raised his voice and said, this is what I think we would do, everyone oh, great idea. And he made a point of saying, I will actually listen to the most junior person in the room because they're the ones closest to what's happening. And I think that's a real key uh, a shift in terms of, of, of leadership as well. So it's that, it's asking different questions, it's being more open. Um, and I talk about this idea of moving from command and control to curiosity. 
And I think another one of your speakers, I think it was Rory, again, maybe talked about the importance of curiosity and leadership. Being genuinely curious and genuinely thinking, I don't know all the answers, I think is really key. And so that's kind of characterized to me by this concept, which came from an HBR article around moving from micromanagement to micro understanding. So really understanding humans at, at the human level. And I think that's something else that, that Rory talked about, bringing human, or humanizing the, the corporation, humanizing leadership is really, really important. So in terms of what Salesforce is doing, um, I talked about this, the shift to, uh, to stakeholder capitalism. Um, we bring have very consistent messaging top down. We use a, a method called the V2MOM, which is vision, values, methods, obstacles, and metrics. And every year we revise our V2MOM, this planning method, where we look at vision um, and we assess have we got the right vision for the coming year ahead. And we will crowdsource input into what are the things which we should be doing. So the whole company can be involved in this process. And once we've established this high level corporate V2 mom, as we call it. Um, every single leader at every level needs to cascade and create their own V2 mom, which taps into this company uh, V2 mom. And so it enables us to be strongly values driven, to have a very clear vision about what we, what we want to accomplish, and also to be adaptive to the environment that we're in uh, for the coming year. And we can adapt that V2 mom. We have a review every half year to make sure that we're also remaining relevant, which for a company of 70,000 people is quite something, but we had to do that particularly during the pandemic, adjust our products, for example, to the needs of the pandemic and other, other, other adaptations, which, which we need to do particularly in this world, which is so dynamic. So those are just a, a few of the things. There are other things, but I think I've, I've probably talked long enough just to kind of get us started, uh, Paul. Does that help? Yeah, yes, that's, that's, you bring up so many critical points. And I, I'd <laughs> like to come back to some of the, if, if we have time, the practicality of moving from that command and control idea to something that is a bit more, for want of a better term, democratic. But, um, you know, what are the actual, you know, the, the difficulties that you'd find with that? And this idea that you have an internal message, but you also have an external message as well, and making sure those are aligned. But um, hopefully we can come back to that. Can I move to uh, Nandani? I mean, energy obviously is, you know, front and center when it comes to people's perceptions of you know role in society and and uh, and uh, the significance of it how do you see things change have changed how how has the idea of leadership and purpose evolved um up to now and both the internal and the external way of looking at it Th thank you and in, indeed building on what ian was saying um and as you point out energy is absolutely at the center of this uh, kind of disrupting world, right? Whether it's climate crisis, whether it's what's, uh, the, what's happening with, with the war in Ukraine, whether it's looking at what developing nations need, energy keeps coming up in the middle of that. And at the same time, the industry itself is, is disrupting, right? How do we move to renewables? How do we go carbon neutral? What's going on with the fossil fuels? Yeah, it, these are huge political, social, and, and much more than that questions. And um, a sixth of the world's electricity runs through Siemens energy machines, lines, you know? So we're very aware that what we do as a company has a direct impact a sizable impact on the world. And let me just add that in addition, as a company, because this here, here we get to leadership, um, obviously we have the name Siemens, that's an 170 year old legacy culture, where we keep saying we're the world's oldest startup because since two years we were carved out, spun off, we've been, a, a, uh, on the, the DAX in, in Germany as a standalone listed company, but it's only two years. And so it's this mix of doing something very new plus doing stuff that's very old, having a new culture that we're building at the same time that we have a very old one. Um, and just two months ago, less than two months ago, we had a, a new operating system which has gone live. It's public knowledge that we're very likely to be integrating the wind power company, Siemens Gamesa, in the coming year. So ch that change that keeps going 
to me, the, the most powerful thing that we are doing um, is that the purpose has been consistent since the first. The actual strategy, we have what we call a strategy one pager on, on, on one page, it outlines how, you know, what are the main challenges? What is the company doing? The purpose is on top. And that strategy document has not changed since we were spun off. And I think it's, it's so important to show people what is consistent and that things like a purpose and even a strategy, or at least the building blocks of the strategy, they, they can stay the same. So you can imagine in what I've all described just now, you know, you may have employees who say, oh my Lord, you know, plus COVID, plus this stuff, the world is chaos, my work is chaos, what's going on? And to keep showing, hey, this hasn't changed and that hasn't changed, right? Yes, we're taking out levels because we wanna hear more from the, from the people closest to the customer, from the people closest to the partnerships that we're building. Um, but certain, certain building blocks are still there. I, I think that's an important part of leadership, not just to come up with them, but to keep communicating them, right? Because you do, you have to take your people along. So just kind of briefly circling back in a way, the question was what leadership challenges do you have? Well, I kind of feel like which ones don't we have, right? In this situation, but what are some of our biggest needs, right? How, how do we build a different kind of partnership with customers, with society, with tech partners, with innovation startups? We've got a whole startup landscape and we have to learn to be a partner and not to be you know, the biggest, oldest gorilla in the room, which is something that could easily be in the DNA still. So it's new behaviors. Even collaborating across silos is new behaviors. And, and as, as this listed company to realize how do I deal with the complexity that so many leaders need to think about what I do, my decisions, what I say can have an immediate impact on this multiple stakeholders. Yes, of course, the markets, but also your own employees, uh, your customers, your partners. Yeah, in this world, everybody's listening. And to me, that's, that's an almost inhuman complexity that people have to deal with. It's, it's, and that takes not just a mind, mindset shift. It's actually about how do we develop our minds to be able to work with that complexity, right? So I think that's the huge development challenge. And, and I'll, I'll just finish quickly because, um, you know, diversity was mentioned, hugely important. We have now a, uh, an executive management board of six people, two are women, it's five different nationalities and ethnic backgrounds, that makes a difference. As we put in the new operating model, we took out half the layers of management and <clears throat> the top layers are now so much more diverse than they were. It makes a difference. Um, ESG we take seriously because especially as an energy company, people are looking and it has direct impact. So things that we're doing also, you know, also with, with your group, I mean, how do we work on leadership at scale? How do we get this kind of information down to leaders and how do we help them understand what I do has an impact? It is very complex and there are ways to be learning that. So I think I'll, I'll stop uh, there yeah. to give a chance, but uh, thank you. Uh, no, you raise a, 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 such a critical point there, which is this issue of consistency. What has, what has to run through consistently that everybody can buy into, but at the same time adapt to change? And I think in the, the, the follow-up, we're going to talk about um, what change lies ahead. And we've had a lot of that discussion already in the session. But the idea of what is constant you know what is what anchors you, and I think that's that that's um, a critical thing. I guess turning to Mitch um, on that issue. I mean, uh, how do you maintain a consistent message about 
uh, you know, the purpose while all around is changing. And you yourself, of course, you know, you're part of a bigger group, but that wasn't always the case. Um, how do you negotiate that possibly a clash of purpose or an realignment of purpose? Yeah, uh, colliding cultures um, of, of coming together. So we, uh, we are very intentional uh, on our design within the, the smaller company, Weber, um, uh, in the U.S. and what we do, but being a part of the Thoreauville family. I think it, it goes back, um, even though we're, we're talking about the changing leadership, there, there are certain things um, that we may give different names and, and different things to it, but it, it comes back to alignment, correct? Understanding culture. Culture is um, huge. The values, um, everyone who's spoken so far and even throughout the day are talking about values. Uh, and how you tie your company to those values are, are just uh, absolutely, uh, um, it, it's imp imperative. You know, we're, we're, we're faced with a lot of, of change from the environment outside itself, from the political that we, we've mentioned, in, from the materials and shortages, labor. Um, you know, you read some articles now, you think this was a new thing, this labor market. I mean, we've been in the talent war for over 100 years. Um, and, and some things are just, Cons consistent, you know, uh, the most certain thing we have is uncertainty. Um, and so uh, what we've done inside is, is we've created a strategy within Thoreauville itself that, that looks over the horizon. Matter of fact, we've given it that name that we, that looking forward um, in, in everything we do, we know we have a world on the move and being in the infrastructure business is, is how do we keep that wor world moving in a very safe and efficient and effective manner? And um, innovation, one of our key values in the company is something that we majorly focus on, uh, not only with inside the company itself, you know, with the initiatives we do, but outside the company, getting um, community thought, getting uh, thought leaders uh, from, from around the world uh, as a part of it. So how do you, how do you take, um, you know, um, yeah, you know, I was listening, um, just talking on Siemens and how huge and, and just the, the amazing things that they're pulling off as I was listening uh, to that. And Ian talked, it, it's, it's all about alignment. It's all about cultures. It's all about values coming back that you've got to know who you are as an organization and in a world of disruptions, don't let the distractions mess up the disruptions. Right. Don't don't let the noise go out. And you've, you've got to remove the noise and it really focused on what's going on when when the pandemic hit us here in the in the U.S., as it did with many people. Our, our first 30 days, we were we had a, a survive mindset, uh, if you will. How do we do this? How do we this is unprecedented. What do we do? But we quickly moved from a survive mindset to a thrive. We realized that as a construction company, an infrastructure company, we had essential workers. We had things that had to continue to move um, things going. And so we knew very intentionally that we had to change the way that we were looking at things and the way that we were gonna work. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot written about the pandemic and, and the change and the impact that it's made for us. For sure, we've felt it, we've lost close friends, um, the impact on us um, has been measurable, but I think in a way, it's almost been like a, a pruning of a plant and, and cutting away some things that I think that is going to allow companies and, and us to, to flourish like we've never be been able to before. We used to, we used to ask, why should we? Now we ask, why can't we? Why can't we do that? Why can't we look at that? And so it's, it's changed the way that we think from, from um, uh, of, of reacting to responding to situations. You know, reactors blow things up. Responders heal. Responders come in and evaluate and make the diagnosis that we need to do that's going to change it. I think that's one of the mindsets that we've seen within Thoreauville, that we've seen in Weber, is to get back to those things that we know are true, our culture, our values, and to be able to look over that horizon to see where we can take things. Yes, I think when you say you've, you've got to know who you are, I think that goes to the heart of it, really, because as you go through really tough times, and there have been some obviously really tough times already, 
um, how do you keep steady? How do you anchor yourself? And in fact, later on, I want to, if we have time, just to talk about mm -hmm. what is going to happen over the horizon. You mentioned that looking over the horizon um, so that um, you don't get thrown off course when you know who you are the sort of resilience, that culture of resilience yeah, has to come absolutely. out. Um, but let me uh, turn to Harriet. So you have a very different perspective here. Um, you're, you see companies from the outside, but you're looking very much at the characters within and the needs and demands of individuals, trying to sort of empower them. Um, how much is uh, that individual motivation really about purpose, the purpose from the company's point of view, but also the purpose from the individual. Tell us, tell us what you see in the market now. I think this is the crux of the issue when it comes to attracting and retaining staff and staff performance and the leaders um, that I'm working with is that when, when they are very clear on who they are and what matters to them and how they want to show up and the kind of um, the kind of organisation they want to be aligned with. They want to be in a place where they feel proud of where they're working, where they feel proud of the difference that the organisation makes and where they know that they can hand on heart align themselves with that organisation. And um, and, in, and in that sense, um, and I know this has already come up, you know, the values piece is just absolutely vital. Um and I think that, that it's one of the places that I'm seeing the biggest disengagement is where senior leaders don't feel that they can really get on board with the organisation or they don't feel it's going in the right direction. That's where people are struggling to retain staff. That's where people are disengaging. That's where they're not performing. Um, so I think um, in, in terms of fulfilment and in terms of people throwing their heart and soul into the work that they're doing and also um, which was already mentioned, this idea of, you know, the great storytelling, the, the putting forward of the vision and bringing everybody along with you. If you can genuinely, authentically put your heart and soul into putting that forward, the people that you're leading feel it, they come along with you um, and they want to be part of it. And, and with that brings that great sense of belonging um, that, that's so important. So I, th I think um, that's, that's a really big part of it. I think one of the other big challenges and this has, of course, been touched on already, is everybody's been, we've been through a lot collectively and we've been through a lot individually. And the world feels more uncertain. And, you know, I'm I'm Gen X. For, for all of us Gen Xers, it, it feels more uncertain than it's ever felt before. And it feels quite sudden that, that this uncertainty, you know, the last few years has come down. And what we see before us is even greater uncertainty. And there's been this big readjustment to, um, perhaps something that I call with my clients, learning to love the questions rather than needing to know the answers and being comfortable with the uncertainty, but so steeped in your, knowing your own self-worth, knowing your values, knowing that you can you can lead, know, knowing that you can hold yourself steady, that it's going to be okay despite the uncertainty. Um, and from that place, actually, it becomes more possible to, to open up to the opportunity. And, um, you know, as Mitch just mentioned, to be in that space of responding healing rather than the defensive attacking mode you know of old yeah um as you say this idea of feeling proud of the organization um you know i i know what it's like to feel proud of an organization i know what it's like not to feel proud of an organization and you know there's a world of difference um i think what you've all alluding to here is um this idea that everyone has a, a bit more of a voice um, and if everyone has a bit more of a voice, whether or not it's directed from the top or whether it's just part of the culture anyway through the organization, this seems to really sort of almost turbocharge that sense of belonging, that sense of purpose. But another thing was mentioned earlier today about growth. And I've always wondered whether or not you, it's, it, you know, it's this, idea of feeling proud of an organization, what it says it represents, or the fact the organization just happens to be doing very well. And we all want to get part of that exciting story. And I'm just wondering whether or not you have any thoughts on, you know, what is the bigger motivator in a sense, if things are going well, you know, you possibly ignore a lot of the bad things in the company. And it's only when things are going bad, that you then 
you know, all these uh, tensions start to surface. Um, do, you, do you have any sort of thoughts on where that line is? That's you, Was Harriet, that direct? sorry. Yes, just checking. Um, okay. I think increasingly, and I think that the period of lockdowns that we experienced here in the UK and in many other different parts of the world has led people home to their values and they're no longer willing to compromise and that that people's values have shifted or their awareness of what matters to them has really shifted. And then they, I think that even if business is going gangbusters and things are going phenomenally well, if they feel that what the organisation that they're working for is doing is uneth unethical, unaligned, there's diversity issues, that they're not practising what they preach. And, you know, we've, we've seen that this week. We've seen it with what's going on in, in Qatar, haven't we? With some organisations that have purposefully said, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling out, um, there's a German supermarket whose name's just escaped me, who've removed their sponsorship from the German national team because they've taken off their armbands, right? And and I I would imagine that people who are working there who, who feel that that kind of allyship is really important to them would feel very proud of it. And I wonder how people who's perhaps the organisation they work for is sponsoring other teams who have towed the party line, but they haven't pulled the sponsorship, how they're feeling. What would that feel like to be um, an LGBTQ plus person in that organization that now realizes the place you work is actually just a performative ally and not a genuine ally. What does that really feel like? And I can imagine that there's people on LinkedIn right now looking to move because they no longer feel safe. They no longer feel like they belong. They can't buy into the vision. It doesn't matter how successful the company is. That stuff is more important than it's ever ever been and and you know with the the shortage of talent or the, the fight for talent i i think that people are well within their rights to say okay well where, where do i feel most aligned where will i be most valued where will i be happiest because we know that when people feel happy and aligned they give their best and perform their best as well and and you know a rising tide lifts all boats why would you not want to be giving that best somewhere where you feel aligned yeah i mean it's a it's an incredibly powerful uh, signal, isn't it? When the company turns around and says, well, we're actually going to take action rather beyond the words, um, regardless of the commercial impact it may or may not have. Um, you know, there's an example of this. Uh, you know, when the Russia crisis happened back in 1998, it was all about how do we deal with this, you know, much more complex emerging market. With the current Russia crisis, what's happened is the companies have pulled out to a great extent as a result of the um, public opinion, customer opinion, stakeholder opinion back in home markets. This is a huge shift and it requires a change in mindset as to where not just the risks, but the expectations now lie um, in the economy. And I'm just, I guess I throw it out to all of you for a sort of a quick response. Um, do you, how do you feel that, um, where the pressures for change are coming from? Is it simply, this is the collective opinion of consumers worldwide, you know, instantaneously sort of uh, uh, logged into what the story of the day is? Um, is it the customers? Is it the stakeholders? Is it just general public opinion? Where is this change that we are seeing and it's going to continue? Where is it, where is it coming from? Uh, maybe Ian, start. Thank, thank you, Paul. Yeah, uh, the, the example that comes to mind for me is um, the establishment in our company of the ethical and humane use of software um, office, which came directly from an internal uh, Slack group where someone internally raised concerns about how our software might be being used. Um, and so uh, our senior leadership responded to that, not by going, oh, we can't talk about that. You know, that's they're kind of off limits. It's like, well, let's listen to that because that's not just the voice of an employee. That's a much bigger voice which is being expressed because, of course, all of our employees are consumers as well, right? They're, they, they represent a much bigger constituency. Um, and I think that's the key, is how do companies deal with those difficult questions? And it's not to say, as we talked about, that you have an answer to those complex questions, but at least you're talking about them and you're getting them out in the open and you're addressing them. 
Um, and I think that's what uh, companies which are more progressive ha have done and will continue to do, which is not to walk away from the difficult questions, but actually to say, let's talk about this. Let's get it out there. We don't know all the answers. So Salesforce is established together with other people within industry to say, let's talk about this and let's come up with some industry guidelines around this problem, which we can all buy into. And I think that's that's the that's the, the way that we should be dealing with these, these these issues which are out there in the bigger societies. I, I think it's reflective of society as a whole, but there's a microcosm of that within within the company. Yes, um, Nandani, everyone seems to have a voice and everyone's voice is increasingly being heard now. Is that where you see things moving over the next sort of five to 10 years? Um, yes, and for us, it's uh, slightly, uh, it's not quite as direct. We don't sell to individual consumers, uh, obviously, but those, those voices are impacting uh, investors. So we see ESG, for instance, as, as a really uh, big movement, and we've fully said we want to be a leader in that. Um, so, so that's a pressure from the market, if you will, that can be used then to change the company in the same way that impacts government. So you get regulations, for instance, in the US, there are new regulations since last year that our customers start asking us uh, or anyone who, who bids on something for them, so what is your diversity, right? Uh, uh, tell us exactly where this money is going. What do you, what's it being put towards? So. Uh, I, I see this as, as, a, as a system that's self-reinforcing where you can use those forces then to make sure that change uh, becomes global and, and also gets moved through the company. So I always look for, you know, where's the big stick from the outside? That's, that's uh, the best way to make stuff happen. Yes. Well, Mitch, on, on this issue, where... where... Where are we going to be sort of five years, 10 years time? Is it just going to be pretty much more of what we're grappling with now? Or do you see something else that's going to affect the way we think about purpose? I, you know, what a great question. And, and if I could figure that answer out and share it right here, we can get a beach house somewhere. Um, I, I, I think it's going to just continuously evolve. The, the thing is, is that humans are humans. Um, and we can't lose the factor of AI and, and all the different noise and things that we see that are predicting and very good, very good. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it, you know, and we're talking about the voices and how loud and, and, and certainly media, um, social media um, has, has given voice. We have to be careful though, that with, within companies, uh, not just the external out there, but I want to hear inside the voice of our own our own people and make sure that it's not just a partial voice out here. And and we have to be careful as as leadership and and, and as companies. Um, man, I, I tell you, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, a crazy world, and we have to be careful in the balance of that with the, with the people. Um, but hearing, hearing that voice, um, understanding how we are made, I think, is very important as humans. Um, and, and I would go to a word, and, I, and the word is significance, that each and every person has incredible significance, not because of what they do, not because of the value they bring their company, but because they're a human being. And understanding that and trying to, to uh, engage that human engage that person to to develop to the the best that they can be. See, a company is it's not us and them. I mean, we're a company of people. We're, there is no company without the people, and so it's the values that we have, and 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 the values are a matter of the heart that transforms what we believe into what we do every day. That's what values are, and um, I think as we look out over that horizon, we cannot lose sight of the human heart and the incredible significance that our people have. Mm. Yes, that's fascinating. Um, I, I just think the topic is so big and it's so hard to define exactly yeah. what's going to carry us through and what's going to be sort of jettisoned along the way. Um, we, we will have to see. 
Um, I, I, we've got some questions and some fantastic questions around the comments you've already made. I'm just going to read out a couple. Um, I think we're probably running out of time here, but um, uh, yes, here from we used to talk about purpose versus profit. Are shareholders starting to see purpose as competitive advantages that can make a business even more profitable? I mean, for sure, things have, are moving that way. Um, it's hard to quantify. Um, who, who, who would like to uh, who would like to take that? Um, our shareholders now pretty much, it seems to me shareholders are very much on board with purpose. It has almost a tangible, almost financial value to it. Um, and Danny, do you want to, do you want to have a, a, a response to that? You know, quickly, I, I think it's true. I think uh, we talked about the consistency, right? And the purpose is what uh, gives the values a sense. And I love what Mitch said about values turning what you believe into what you do. And so if, if you are aligned, then purpose is telling you actually what people are gonna do. And that will presumably turn into a profit unless things go very, very crazy. So I think they're much more, more married. I think the, the stakeholders see them as two sides of a coin uh, much more than they used to. Mm. Um, Harriet, I want to ask you, um, a question about uh, what, looking forward five to 10 years, um, what do you think the company can represent to the individual employee, given all the stresses that we've talked about, the tech stress, the changing global environment, um, that need to be heard, that need to, um, uh, have a voice and obviously the question of diversity which is becoming ever more sort of fundamental how would people view a company do, do they see a company as something that can protect them as a safe haven or do they see the company as something that's kind of almost disaggregate the person what can you offer you know what, what are your skills how how can we leverage your skills uh, to the to the most um, is it something of a company being almost a humane place to be. It's something that encourages you, encourage that sort of self space to develop as a person or something maybe a bit dystopian where what are the skills you can offer and how much are they worth uh, that kind of calculation? How do you th see things in the future? I see it as very much developing as a partnership. I don't think it has to be either or. I think it can be both. It can be a place where given the skills that you bring to the table, and the company's um, operations, what they do and how that aligns and how the values align um, and, and how that your purposes can actually come together to to almost accelerate um, and, and move move everybody forwards in the same direction. I think to see it as having to be one or the other is is missing a trick there. Um, very much so. And I th and I think one of the things that is increasingly important to people is the sense of where will my career develop? How will I be supported to do this? And within that um, understanding that, that there are different traits that are being valued in terms of leadership compared to, say, five, 10 years ago, where it was pretty much you know about, about results and competitiveness and assertiveness and all these kinds of things, whereas now empathy, vulnerability, collaboration, all these kinds of things. And I think there's an awful lot more people who feel that on that basis and the direction that things are moving in, it's something that they can throw their heart into and really align with. Um, and so I think it, with that, that sense of partnership and not just common purpose, but also common journey and common understanding of how we will best get there together. Um, I think that's where the greatest gain and um, fulfillment as well as pure profit and success lies. Mm, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting way in which, you know, we see this shift, but actually perhaps those of an older generation are pleasantly surprised when one talks about the sort of empathy um, and togetherness and listening. And this, you know, it's almost welcome that this command and control thing actually isn't the reality. Things are moving. And I think, as you say, everyone, it's not just a generational thing. Everyone can in, sort of thrive a little, uh, thrive a little bit better. 
Um, I'm just going to end. We've really got a, a, maybe a minute. Uh, one question here I want to know. Absolute Gems. Um, if you're given three pieces of advice for a small business that's trying to scale, what would that be? Um, so think about this idea of purpose, but in a trying to scale, maybe maybe not so much three. Or we'll take three from each of you. Can you think of one piece of advice, Ian? What's what would your piece of advice for someone trying to scale um, uh, and um, maintain that purpose? Well, I, I think it comes down back to this, starting with the why, being very, very clear on why you exist as a corporation and what is it that you're fulfilling as a function in society over and above simply making a profit. That would be my 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 one. Okay, Mitch? Um, have a solution mindset. Be a solution. Never a quick no, but a slow yes. How do you get to yes with your customers, with your employees? Understand them and get to a yes with them. And Danny, I'd say it's how do you involve people? How do you make that a conversation with your employees, even with your customers, with your partners? Discuss with them. You know, we still want to do this purpose. We're getting bigger. How can that look? How can maybe that can grow as well? Mm, okay. And finally, Harriet, from the individual's point of view, what is it they have well, to consider? Be, be, being, being a purpose-driven business who is currently scaling, um, the biggest advice that I would be, that I would have from my own experience here is to get help, ask for help, get really great mentoring, look up the ladder at people who know how to do it and know know how to, to, to achieve that growth without compromising on purpose and get their advice, collaborate, um, and and you don't you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. There's there's so many incredible people, and in the purpose driven world, we're all incredibly keen to uplift each other. Um, so collaboration is key. Mm. Well, that's a very uplifting way to end this session. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's we've ended yes on a very optimistic note that things are working out. We're getting that a sense of where the corporate the company can go to, what it can be. Um, and experience shows that it's many, many cases is working. People are on board with it. So um, Ian, Nandani, Nandani, Mitch and Harriet, thank you so much for ending this session. And I'm going to hand back to Gustav, who will uh, end with a few words. Thank you so much. What a powerful way to conclude this afternoon on the topic of the why, purpose, purposeful leadership, and the many great uh, stories and perspectives that you shared. Uh, so thank you, Paul, and all of you panelists.